So hello, I'm very pleased to announce that three researchers from FXPAL are joining us today. Um, Dave Hilbert, Laurent Denou, and Daniel Bilsis to talk about um, some efforts towards organizing and classifying multimedia information, which falls in line to Google's vision. Um, so anyway, they will be around after the talk if you'd like to join us for lunch. And Daniel is the first speaker. Well, thanks for the introduction, Monica. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Daniel Bilsis, and together with um, Laurent Denou and David Hilbert, we'll talk about our work on seamless capture and discovery for corporate memory. And before I begin, let me say a few words about um, FXPAL. So FXPAL stands for FX Palo Alto Laboratory. We're obviously located in Palo Alto. Uh, we're a research lab for Fuji Xerox, about 50 people total, uh, approximately 25 researchers, do work in a number of different areas, ranging from multimedia to teleconferencing, HCI to information management. And our job is basically to be uh, creative and come up with intellectual property for, for Fuji Xerox, then turn our ideas into prototypes and evaluate them and um, deploy them. And today we're here to talk about our work on information management, or uh, more specifically, corporate memory and seamless uh, information capture and discovery. And those are um, things and, and ideas that people have really been thinking about for a long, long time, as you all know. So um, let's go back in time. Um, um, over 60 years ago, in 1945, Vannevar uh, Bush published a landmark article entitled As We May Think in the Atlantic Monthly. And it's a, it's a really, really interesting piece of work. Um, he sort of envisioned this uh, mechanical device based on microfilm that makes it really easy for, for people to store all the information that they interact with, basically books they read or uh, personal correspondence. And then this device um, helped people find information as well, but not only by searching, but also by associating information with other pieces of information and, and, and linking. And um, this was back then really groundbreaking uh, work. It sort of anticipated or inspired a lot of te technologies that we now take for granted, the, the internet, um, hypertext, um, Wikipedia. Uh, Microsoft's work on my life bits that you might be familiar with is obviously closely related to this work. And, and you could argue, of course, that Google is sort of an uh, instantiation of uh, the memory extender or memex idea as well. Uh, so what we're interested in here is um, to take these ideas into the corporate space and try to come up with this corporate memex, so, uh, uh, shared um, a device or um, piece of software that everyone in an organization can use to, uh, to manage corporate knowledge. And so what do we mean by, by corporate memory? Well, um, to put it in, in George uh, Schultz's words, uh, the former US um, Secretary of State, uh, he just said, well, corporate memory allows a company to know what it knows. And we always like this really simple definition. But of course, for, for large organizations, it's a really big deal. If you don't have technology like that, um, companies don't operate as efficiently as they could otherwise. Um, so the idea here is we really want people to reuse information. We want them to reuse solutions instead of reinventing them. We want people to coordinate um, instead of replicate. And um, so it's, it's a really, really important um, issue, but um, it's a very difficult problem to get right. And what we did at FX Palace, we tried to focus on a number of challenges that make this problem so difficult. Well, for one, we focused on information capture. The problem here is that people simply won't add information to um, a, a, a corporate memory if there's no immediate benefit. I mean, people don't do extra work just for the purpose of, of sharing information. So what we need is technology that sort of makes the capture process a part of you know, your, your everyday work routine. So things that you do anyway without adding, adding any extra overhead. Um, uh, we're also looking at information discovery. I mean, of course, keyword search goes a long way, but that's not enough. If people don't know about content that's potentially available to them, they won't even search for the right things. And also, you can't spend um, all your time during the day searching content, especially not if, if all of that content is in, in all kinds of different repositories throughout the organization. And we're also looking at the actual content that we're storing on our corporate memory. So we think corporate memory should be much more than just documents alone. 
So organizations have people. They have all different um, areas of expertise. These people attend meetings. They give presentations. And ideally, we'd like to be able to capture all of that and, and make it part of our corporate memory. So um, now get, getting back to the um, Memex vision, um, you could argue, well, corporate intranets are sort of very simple instantiations of, of the Memex idea. But we really want to move beyond just a corporate intranet. We don't want to work with you know, an intranet that is basically just a dumping ground for a lot of information where you collect a lot of stuff that is basically inaccessible to people because it's hard to find. Um, so what we're all about is helping organizations actually take advantage of all the, uh, um, the, the content that it's, that's available to them, making use of their intellectual capital. And the way we're doing that is um, without really adding any extra work um, whatsoever by, by integrating both capture and discovery into everyday work practices. So let's try to make things much more concrete. Um, so at FXPAL, uh, we have a number of different content repositories, just like any other organization. We have um, information on our intranet, so basically our products, such as reports, publications, and inventions. We have a, a visitor guestbook where our visitors can stop by, sign in, record a little video, tell people who they are, who they're visiting, and so forth, scan their business cards. We have a number of community displays called the uh, plasma poster, and the idea here is that people can simply um, post web pages, email web pages to this poster so that other um, employees can just walk by, glance at it, and sort of see what people are currently thinking about. Then we have a more recent system, and that's actually a, a, a very interesting system called Ubisite for um, completely automated meeting capture. And the idea here is that we use um, uh, motion tracking and audio tracking in conference rooms to automatically record video of, of meetings. And once we have these um, videos, we store them in our multimedia database, Embase. Um, but the point of all of this is that, yes, we have a lot of useful content, but really, as a corporate memory, it's not all that useful, in part because, for example, there's, there, there was up until recently no a content-based way to access these meetings. So yes, we had a lot of video, but what does that help you if you just keep storing um, these uh, video files and people then have to go to, you know, maybe some some video browsing interface and uh, and 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 try to to find information that way, which is something that usually didn't happen. Um, overall, people had to just manually locate relevant information throughout all of these different repositories. So the end result is that people tended to basically ignore um, content that was available. So today we want to talk about two new prototypes that we have. Uh, one is for um, in, uh, seamless information capture. It's a system called Projector Box that automatically captures presentation slides and audio. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have a system for information discovery called PALBAR that proactively um, recommends content to users based on what they're currently working on. Um, so that's what we'll talk today, about today. And in the end, I'll show you how all of these different pieces come together um, as a unified uh, multimedia corporate memory. So from here, we'll move on to um, seamless information capture. And David Hilbert will tell you more about our projector box system. Hey, hi there. I'm David Hilbert. I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, so, as Daniel mentioned, projector box is uh, one of the components in our corporate memory, but it's also an independent component that can be deployed on its own, basically to capture and index presentations given in an organization. And so, I'll be talking about projector box as an independent component, and then. Laurent Denou, who's the creator of Projector Box, will show you a demo. And then Daniel's going to show you how this works as a piece of the uh, overall corporate memory as the indexing component for retrieving videos. Um, so, you know, why Projector Box? Well, pre presentations are everywhere. We're doing one right now. And we actually believe that they're quite informative. They're, they're actually the, you know, they encapsulate the distillation of research and analysis and a lot of knowledge work. Um, one of the problems is that a lot of what goes on in a presentation, particularly what the speaker is saying in the discussion, just never makes it into the corporate intranet at all, right? And so, in some sense, you know, this information is passing through projectors all over an organization every day and simply being lost. And what we want to do is be able to preserve that information and make it very easy to retrieve. And so, one question that arises immediately is why are archives so rare, given that there is just a plethora of tools out there for capturing presentations? 
And to us, the hypothesis is that there's always some additional cost or complexity, or even the user experience could be the problem. If someone just needs to start and stop the recordings, that may be enough to keep presentations from being captured on a regular basis. I mean, obviously in a situation like this, you've got people manning video cameras and other things, but um, what we're looking at is a way to do this really easily. The user experience should be, don't even have to think about it. So we're focusing on creating useful archives without any added burden on anyone. <clears throat> okay, so what's projector box? It's basically a smart appliance that uh, intercepts the video signal. Uh, the VGA cable coming out of uh, any presentation device goes through the projector box on its way to the projector. Uh, a key feature is that we apply um, image OCR to extract the text from slide images and create an index. And then we just capture audio using a microphone. Uh, then we automatically build a web archive for easily retrieving content, the slides, the text, and the audio. And we have some simple UIs for retrieving content, skimming content, and then we have a web service API that allows us to build other services on top of that. Okay, so um, this is an example of one of our prototypes. It's basically just a small PC um, appliance. It's got a video capture card and a splitter. So all you need to do in order to capture presentations in a meeting room is plug in the power, plug in a microphone. Uh, the VGA cable from the laptop goes in one end, comes out the other end, and goes to the um, uh, projector. And the key feature, of course, is that once you've done that, you don't have to do anything else. So no one has to start or stop recordings. Projector Vax is analyzing the video as it comes through when it detects what looks like presentation contact, content, it captures it, and it ignores all of the other content. Um, and then again, we have some uh, sort of novel interfaces for searching and skimming the content, which Laurent's going to show you. And the key, um, other key feature is that we want to do this with no change to presentation practice. So when a visitor comes to our organization, we don't want to have to ask them to copy their files somewhere or to install some software on their laptop or do anything else. They just connect their RGB cable and we capture. So without further ado. Hi. Good morning. So let me show you a demo of um, the website that people go to, to to retrieve presentations. They have basically two ways of uh, finding presentations. They have the search box, and they have a browsing interface by, by date. So if you know that the presentation was captured on, on the 21st, you can dive into that day directly, and you end up into the day view, where you can easily browse the slides that have been automatically captured by PBOX. And mouse look at a Renaissance office, which is right next door. There's actually a connecting door <coughs> into um, information. And quickly skim the content to get an overview of what's, what, what's captured. Um, I'm going to mute the audio. Uh, you can also quickly export uh, things if you want to watch the content uh, offline, or if you want to share the content uh, using. Um, uh, USB. Renaissance <laughs> office, which is right next door. There's actually a connecting <coughs> door into only just a few. Well, what we actually does in this room. So this is a very convenient interface for getting a sense of what was captured in the meeting and browsing very fast. The second way, obviously, is to use the search engine that we have. Uh, Peter, uh, who recently joined the organization, had a meeting um, and was curious about the printing industry and if we had partners in this domain. So he went to PBOX and looked for uh, this uh, topic on PBOX and was quickly able to find a relevant presentation that uh, was given uh, a few months before he came um, that talked exactly about this. So he went to the player mode and um, quickly skimmed the presentation that was given before he came, uh, realized that was very relevant to what he was looking for, and went to the first slide and boom, he got the name of the person he should contact. So it was a very efficient way for him to, to get in touch with this person. Um, on the top, you can see also a histogram that shows you the uh, popularity of the topic you're looking for across time, which is a very interesting way to realize um, how popular and how far back in time this topic um, uh, is important in, in your uh, organization. Um, Another service that we have is a real-time viewer. So if you are in a, in a talk with your laptop, you can quickly go to this web page to see the slides that have been captured uh, in real time, go back to read something that you may have missed, uh, do some web search by selecting the words. 
You can also, if you're not very familiar with English, you can select in your preferred language uh, a translation, a word-to-word -word translation, to give you a sense of what, what's going on uh, and help you understand what people are saying. Um, so before I come back to the presentation, I'd like to show you what kind of things that PBOX does in the background. If you select all images, you see all images that have been effectively captured and grayed out are um, the ones that PBOX believes are not slides. So you see it does a pretty good job at classifying images automatically and detecting slides. So the, to detect slides, we we use a very simple method, which is uh, leveraging the OCR result that we, we have because we apply OCR on each image. And we just currently use the average font height to say if, if an image is a slide or not a slide. Uh, to present, uh, to classify the, the presentation, find the boundaries between presentations, we're using just time uh, currently. And, but we're looking into uh, more elaborate ways of doing that. In terms of storage costs, it's very, very minimal. Uh, not just for storage, which is cheap, you could argue, but also for bandwidth requirements. So when people go to the website, they can um, quickly get a sense of the content without having a high um, DSL connection or anything like that. David? OK. So um, in addition to developing this technology, we're really interested in deploying it in the real world and understanding what users are going to do with it and try to find opportunities for making this better suit the needs of particularly corporate users, but we're also interested in educational use. So we've done a few deployments in both corporate settings and educational settings, and I just wanted to tell you, just highlight you know, a summary of some of the, the uh, results from our laboratory's use versus use at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. So in summary, um, it was a very, you know, very simple kind of model, and it worked pretty well across these two different uh, domains. Uh, in both cases, uh, it was primarily used for missing you know, people missed presentations. So students really liked the fact that they could look at the archive before asking the professor or, or other students. And then people in both settings also reported paying more attention during talks and taking less notes because they felt confident they could go back to the archive and retrieve any details that they needed at a later time. Um, so the main difference was that, as you might guess, in the educational setting, people were using this as a study aid preparing for exams and doing homework. But in the corporate setting, 75% uh, of our users said that in addition to looking at past presentations, they used it as a tool to stay aware of what was going on in the organization, sort of a corporate awareness uh, tool. So we were very interested in finding out what was missing. Obviously, we're focusing on static slide content and audio, and we're not taking video of the room, and we wanted to know, you know, what, what's missing? And so uh, people in both settings did mention that they missed not seeing video clips embedded in presentations or live demos. So that's something that we're working on now. We focused on, on static presentation content. We should probably also capture video clips when that makes sense. Uh, the students actually did miss whiteboard capture, and that's something that we're not going to focus on because many people have worked on that before, and also because Fuji Xerox is more interested in the corporate market. But uh, interestingly, most of the students reported just not being very interested in video. They just felt they didn't need to see the professor. Um, slides and audio really suited their needs for uh, a study aid. So this was an interesting result. And this may depend on who your professor is and how interesting they are. Um, but so I don't know how much this generalizes, but that was an interesting result. And then in both cases, people noted that it would be useful to be able to retrieve content based on the audio or what was said in the room. And so that's something we're going to work on. And we know that with our current situation, we're not doing close micing. We're not going to get great you know, speech to text. But even if we can get just a little bit more retrieval on things that appeared in the speech that weren't in the uh, slides, I think that would be very useful. And so it validated our design. You know, we focused on searching and skimming, which is a little different than other people who have worked in this area. And the searching was, in fact, important in the corporate setting, particularly where we had years of data. People really wanted to be able to search and find content in the past. And skimming was very important. In both settings, people infrequently would sort of play back slides sequentially, which is the model that most slide viewers for these kinds of tools take. People really liked the ability to just skim around, look for you know, passages that were interesting for them, or find content that was of particular interest. And then finally, it identified some new directions for improving support for corporate users. So uh, in particular, uh, corporate users said that they wanted support for um, you know, finding personally relevant information. So instead of having to search for things or to browse for things, you know, how can we bring that information to their attention? And finally, privacy and access uh, control and security came up as well. So I'm just going to very briefly tell you about some of these new directions and then hand it back to Daniel. 
So this is just an early prototype where we were exploring new interfaces for discovering content. Um, so in addition to searching and browsing, we were trying to find out, can we highlight things that are either new or interesting to employees? So in the, in the top part of the interface, we're um, trying to identify presentations that look like they were given by external visitors. So we're just looking at the content of the presentation, looking for names and, and some content, and saying, these look like they're external presentations. These might be of interest to you. Because we're a small lab, and we've kind of seen each other's presentations a million times. So this was one way of getting at you know, what's, what's interesting. And then we also played around with a, a tag cloud interface for trying to highlight what were the kind of novel topics this month that maybe weren't so novel, uh, weren't so common in the past. And so this is early work, and we're going to continue extending this. This is just another interface for exploring content in PBOX. So the idea is that you can select different time frames, like a year or a month or a day, and then get a sense using this uh, tag cloud again of what are the hot topics during that, that period. OK, so <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the educational setting, security and privacy were not an issue at all. The students and the uh, lecturers knew they were being recorded and wanted to be recorded. But uh, in the corporate setting, there are issues here. So one thing is that when people walk into our conference room and they start presenting, um, it's very easy for us to forget to mention to them that they're being recorded because this is all happening so uh, autonomously. So we've developed some intellectual property in a couple of areas. One of them is uh, actually doing an overlay in the projection screen that would, would basically you know, indicate that a recording was happening. And there are ways that we could actually intercept you know, uh, or detect mouse movements in the video stream and provide a very simple interface for turning the recording on or off. Um, another thing that we th thought about is actually a physical um, indicator and switch that would be built into an RGB cable. So when people are actually connecting to the laptop, it's a very immediate and tangible way to indicate they're being recorded and allow them to opt in or opt out. So those are a couple avenues we're looking at. Access control is another issue. So at Fuji Xerox, um, it's a huge corporation. They've got a lot of meeting rooms, and the meeting rooms are shared by multiple different groups. And while the groups would like to be able to archive their content and share it sort of locally, they don't necessarily want everyone else in the organization to see the content. And so we're trying to find ways to support access control without uh, breaking the user experience, which is just utmost simplicity. So we're looking at the use of smart cards or biometrics to identify the person who's presenting and then use that as a way of setting up default access control on the content, allowing them to then release the content after the fact more widely if they want. We're also looking at alternative form factors. So the marketing and planning people at Fuji Xerox were really keen on a personal version of this. So our colleagues, research colleagues in Japan have already developed a version of PBOX that just runs on a USB drive. And the idea is it captures the content on the drive. And then when you plug the drive in to a network connected computer, it can upload it to the server. And this also um, shares the feature with uh, the smart cards that we can associate these devices with a person or a team, and then we can automatically do the access control, at least initially. So in summary, you know, we feel that useful information is passing through projectors all the time and simply being lost in organizations. And we were trying to come up with a very simple way of preserving this information and making it easily retrievable, both for users in the one case, and also for services, such as the real-time slide enhancement and the corporate memory, which Daniel's going to show you. <laughs> So many people contributed. So. OK, um, from here, let's move on to seamless information discovery. Um, again, as I said uh, earlier, FXPAL has many different repositories. Content is available all over the place. David just talked about uh, our uh, projector box archive that's um, generated automatically. Um, I briefly mentioned our Ubisite system earlier that automatically um, records video of presentations. And now the question is, well, how can we help people um, discover information in all of these different repositories. Um, so to do that, we have um, seamless information discovery technology, a system called PALBAR. And the idea here is that the system tries to automatically figure out what you're currently doing based on, say, the current web page you're looking at, uh, email message that you're reading or writing. And then it tries to proactively uh, recommend content to you that you should be aware of. 
Um, and the concept itself is not new. You might uh, be familiar with systems like Watson or the Remembrance Agent has been around for a long time. But there are a number of user interfaces that I want to show you that make this, in addition to some algorithmic um, bells and whistles that we have, quite unique. And part of the novelty also lies in the actual um, integration of all those different um, pieces of our uh, corporate memory. So, as I said, the idea is instead of uh, asking users to uh, manually enter queries and search for things, um, we're trying to let the system figure out um, if there's content that you might be interested in automatically. So this is what it looks like. Um, Palbar is a toolbar. We currently support um, uh, Firefox, IE, and Outlook, so it works for both um, email and web pages. And now the idea is that whenever you go to a new web page, uh, the bar extracts the entire text from that page, sends it down to our server. Now this server will automatically convert um, the text into a query, and then it has a full text index um, based on all of these different repositories that I talked about. So it sends a query to, to these repositories. Um, we're getting matches back. Uh, we're looking then at the exact similarity between the text and the matches we're, we're getting. And if they're above a certain threshold, these recommendations will be sent up to the bar. And then it's up to the bar to render recommendations and make them available to users. And we have a number of different interfaces that I want to show you. This is what the um, original initial version looked like. So let's assume I'm a research scientist at FXPAL and I'm interested in, in web services. So I just opened up my browser, uh, went to a web services web page, and of course I'm using Palbar, this toolbar up there. Um, <clears throat> what's happening is Palbar will take a look at the page and if it finds related information, it will tell the user through these recommendation buttons here um, that correspond to different categories of content that we have. And the idea is whenever something uh, interesting is available, um, the system will change the color of a button so that the user knows, okay, I can just click on this to basically get a menu that lists documents that are closely related to this web page as well as people that have done work in this area. So in this case, basically the authors um, of these documents here. And so this sort of worked okay, but um, as you can maybe guess, um, one thing that we immediately figured out after a uh, user study that we did was that, well, the nice thing is that Palbar really doesn't get in the way at all. Users don't find it distracting, and that's that little uh, red bar on the left side. But the flip side of it is that users typically forget that the bar is there. So it's just a little bit too subtle in this case to actually be useful. So then um, we did some more work and came up with an alternative interface. Um, so in this case here, um, in addition to changing the color of buttons, we can automatically and proactively show these recommendation windows that look like this. So they show up um, automatically for particularly relevant uh, recommendations, and you can now see a little bit more content. You can see the title of a document that's recommended, the uh, name of an author. You get an initial indication as to why um, this document was recommended to you. Um, you can look at the query that the server generated automatically. You can see how the query matches the document that's being recommended, and you can also see how it matches uh, the web page that you're currently looking at. If you don't interact with these windows, they just disappear automatically after a few seconds. Now again, as you might guess, what we found out then is that yes, I mean it's sort of nice that people don't forget that the bar is there, but the flip side again is that now they find it just a little bit too distracting. So sometimes it, it gets in the way and users don't want to interact with these recommendations right away while they're working on other things. Um, so this led us to um, another interface that we have, and this one we call the Recommendation Digest. And here the idea is that we sort of aggregate recommendations over time, um, recommendations that you might not have seen because you might not have clicked on these, these buttons. But here the idea is, let's say, um, if during uh, a week of, of doing my regular work, um, I went to, let's say, five different pages that all talk about music information retrieval. And the bar keeps recommending documents to me um, that I might not have seen or looked at. The idea here is we can aggregate these recommendations over time, 
and then make that information available as part of these digests that people can either request explicitly by clicking on the digest button and request either a daily or, or a weekly digest, or, and this is actually the way most people use this at FXPAL, you can subscribe to digests through email. And so then the system sends out these, these emails once a week to our employees basically saying, well, based on your um, browsing and email reading activities during the week, here are the top 10 uh, documents that you should be aware of. And this is sort of an indication as to why they were recommended to you. You can go back to the original pages that triggered these recommendations. And it turns out this is um, actually the main way by which people at our organization access recommended content. Now at this point, I'd like to show you a brief demo of the system. And, and now the main point of this demo is to show you how the, the capture and the discovery pieces of our system come together. Now just a few slides ago, I showed you a recommendation window for a text document. Now the point is that since Projectorbox captures uh, presentations automatically, we can of course recommend presentations. And that's what you're seeing in this interface here, where we basically have a recommendation window, but instead of just showing text, we can show slides. People can then flip through these slides, and from there, jump right back into the recorded video um, of a presentation. And that's what I'm going to show you in the demo. So let's start my browser. So let's look at this first scenario here. Let's again uh, assume I'm a research scientist at FXPAL, and I'm now interested in service grids. And let's say I'm going to this web page here that talks about service grids. So what you see is that within a few seconds, Palbar came up with this recommendation window. I can immediately see that my colleague Masao Kato recently wrote a paper on service grids. I can see the query that the server generated and how it matches the recommendation um, and the web page that I'm looking at. Now, if I don't interact with this window, it should just automatically disappear within a few seconds. And there it goes. But let's look at the uh, maybe more interesting scenario here where Palbar automatically recommends um, uh, a recorded presentation. So in this scenario, let's assume, again, I'm a research scientist at FXPAL. Now I'm interested in collaborative filtering. So Let's assume I go to a web page that talks about collaborative filtering. And again, within just a few seconds, Palbar comes up and tells me, oh, there was a recent research presentation on this topic. Now, directly in this interface here, I can look at slides. I can flip through slides. And whenever I come across something that looks interesting, I can jump right back into automatically recorded video. So I can do that by just clicking on this video link here. And then our video player comes up. and the point here is that on the left side, you can see the original uh, meeting go by, the recorded video. On the right side, you see slides go by. Down here, you see a timeline of the presentation. Those blue bars are slide transitions, and those red squares are relevant slides. So in this case, the system actually knows where the user came from. And in this case, it was um, collaborative filtering. So you can see that when I click on these red squares, the system immediately takes me to slides that talk about collaborative filtering. So the point is that with just one or two mouse clicks, I can jump right into the most relevant parts of a presentation. And the really nice thing about it is that there's really no work that anyone had to do to accomplish this. The video was recorded automatically, slides were recorded automatically, and then it was recommended to the user at sort of the right point in time. And this really addresses an issue that we had all the time at FXPAL, where people come and go, they give these presentations, maybe sometimes to only small groups of people. Just like we do right now, we're giving a presentation to a small group of people. And once, once we go home, it's unclear how that content will be used. Right? And that's an issue that we have, where this system really helps us take advantage of you know, speakers that come by, um, give a presentation, and we can, without any, any overhead or effort, reuse this information. Let me say a few more words about recommendation uh, interfaces. Um, so of course, people are sometimes already used to certain um, notification UIs that they might already use for, for email notification and so forth. Um, so one of the things that we implemented recently is an extension for 
actually technology that we got from you guys for the uh, Google desktop and the sidebar. So let me bring up the Google sidebar here. And the idea is that we have this little recommendation plugin that can render recommendations and basically add it to your sidebar. And let's just look at the exact same scenario again. Let's go to this web page. And obviously, I can turn off these big recommendation windows if I don't like them. But the point now is that um, these recommendations are added to the side of the screen. And the real big advantage is that people are now not forced anymore to interact with these recommendations right away. So at any point in time, when you have a moment, you can just glance at them, see if there's something relevant there. And you can uh, just click on it. And that brings up basically uh, the same interface that I just showed you to look at individual slides. And of course, um, the other nice thing that allows us, that we can do now with um, the, the, the sidebar is to hook into your um, alert system for, for rendering notifications, similar to, to email or, or news alerts. All right, um, let's briefly jump back into the presentation. In terms of future work, uh, one thing we're really interested in right now is email integration. Of course, no corporate memory is complete without email. There's a lot of corporate knowledge buried somewhere in, in email. But of course, that's a tricky issue because there are obviously um, a lot of privacy concerns. Um, and, and it's hard to get right because our whole philosophy is no overhead for the user whatsoever. Um, so we'd like to, to stick to that ideal as, close as, as closely as possible. Um, and um, maybe go from, from, say, seamless information capture to painless information capture, where we have just very, very little user interactivity to make it real easy for people to, to share content with the organization that might be non-confidential. In that context, we're really interested in usable access control. Uh, we're also interested in extending our corporate memory beyond corporate boundaries. So can you take mobile devices, access your corporate memory, or even use mobile devices to, to capture content and bring it back into the organization? We're currently implementing a new um, enterprise knowledge portal. And as part of that, we're looking at different ways to, to visualize corporate memory information through text mining and, and visualization techniques. And with that, well, actually, one more thing that I wanted to mention. We're clearly interested in more evaluation of the system. And you know, one piece of this evaluation that's critical for us, obviously, is how to make money with this technology. And as part of that, um, we've recently deployed um, our corporate memory system as a sales support tool for our colleagues in Japan. So the idea is that they get immediate access to related sales proposals, um, customer information, product information, and so forth. Uh, so in summary, this was a brief overview of our corporate memory work. The main idea is that we support both sides of the spectrum, information capture and information discovery without um, any uh, user overhead whatsoever. And that really takes us, in our opinion, really one step closer to a real corporate memex. And with that, I'd just like to thank you. Here's our contact information. And I'd also be happy to um, take any questions. Thank you. Yes. So uh, a lot of the, um, so, so what, what I think you, you've observed the problem that uh, people don't want to put the information, take the trouble to manually put the information. People don't want to take the trouble to manually search for it. So you're, um, you're basically trying to take um, all of the actions out of the hands of, of the users. When wondering if in a lot of these cases where you've got two sides that don't want to, either side wants to go the whole way, a lot of mileage can be had by getting each one to part way. And so in terms of uh, getting the people who are creating the information, so, so, so tagging is, is a very simple way to get to get people to go half way. So, so very easy little bits of collaborative filtering. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, I was trying to figure out how one could how, how one could add that facility for that. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if, you know, if, if everything is um, if everything is sort of automated in these in, in these seal components mm -hmm. with a seal relevant structure. I'm not sure how to go from uh, 
if, if I disagree with what it's showing me, how can I how can I say, you know, no, this isn't about that, it's actually about that. Yes, I mean, there, there is a little bit of, of interactivity, and I think there are, th those two approaches are also not mutually exclusive. I think it makes a lot of sense to automate as much as possible, but if users feel like there is some value in, in providing feedback, we can take that into account. So right now, you know, there are very simple things that we, that we support. You can, you can add recommendations to a blacklist so that the system doesn't ever show you that information again. Of course, we could, we could provide some form of relevance feedback that we could you know, factor into the algorithm. That's entirely feasible. We, we don't do that right now. And, and as I said earlier, um, especially for our work on, on email, I think a little bit of interactivity there is, is critical, where we really can't do completely seamless information capture. Sure. I wanted to add one very brief comment. So in the projector box work, um, Laurent is very keen on actually adding tagging. And, and we're not really sure how and if people will use that or not, but that is something that we're going to do. So, And I think that we could at least expect people to, you know, maybe for their own content, tag it in different ways to remember it's there and bookmark it and other things. And then maybe we'll discover new uses for tagging. But that's one thing we've been thinking about. This sort of vision of the future in terms of tagging, you know, so I'm, I'm sitting here with my laptop. Um, of watching your talk, and I can imagine saying, thinking, oh, this is relevant to food. And you know, I just hit in a couple of keywords, and, and you know, somehow this, you know, um, we, um, we say that um, these are essentially annotations on your, on, on your thing, so that people looking through say, you know, Pablo thinks this is relevant to collaborative filtering. And, you know, and, uh, Jeff or whomever thinks that this is relevant to something or another, and so you could you could build. Um, you know, we're already taking notes. Right. Why not? Why not have them be sticky to whatever we're taking notes on? No, that's a very a very nice idea. And actually, the work that led to Projector Box started with a collaborative note taking tool, where you know, in basically. People were sharing slide images, grabbing text from the images, and sharing notes collaboratively. And so it's very in, in the spirit of what, where this work came from. And I think that this could be a very useful uh, direction to take it. So. Do you recommend things outside of the program you turn up? Or do you recommend documents that are in like, NEC's database? Or Yes, I mean, uh, so the whole system is pretty customizable. So you can basically, you know, uh, set it up to send your query wherever you want. In our case, we currently don't do that proactively, but you can explicitly request information from other repositories based on the page that you're looking at. And you know, the, the, the nice thing of limiting the proactive approach to our intranet is that recommendations are, are typically pretty focused on and related to what we're actually working on rather than going off to, let's say, Google and you know, grab content from the web or something. Anything else? Thank you.